This is our uh, afternoon session here, predictive modeling and fundraising applications and approaches. And uh, on our panel today, we've got John Pava of Rapid Insight and Michael Pasqua of Mills College. Thanks. So everybody, a little bit of a food coma after lunch. Always a great time to give a presentation. So um, thanks for being here. It's a big giant room, so it looks like you know we're doing pretty good. If it was a smaller room, it would look better, but thank you. Um, I have some cards in front of some of you, and there's some others on the thing. Before you leave, if you could fill those out, it would help us out a bunch. Um, just we won't get to all the questions, but we did, I think, leave enough time at the end to make this more of a back and forth question and answer thing at the end. Um, just real quick, who here is building predictive models currently? Just to get a feel for, okay, who here is wanting to build predictive models? Awesome. Okay, so today Mike is from Mills College. He's gonna talk a little bit about um, one of the themes of the conference I think that we've seen is that communication problem of if you go to your VP of advancement and you start talking to them about data and predictive modeling, they get this glazed look and they go, what's in it for me? So um, in a short story, I'll tell you real quick, and a true story, um, Vice President of Advancement contacts Rapid Insight looking to see if we could build a model for him. Of course, we can do that. That's something we do. It's not something we want to do um, on a regular basis for too many of our customers, because our goal is that you guys can do it yourself. Um, so the cost to do that is literally two or three times the cost it would be for the software. So we're looking through the account, and I see that the Director of Advancement has actually been trying to get the software for over three years, but has been turned down by the Vice President of Advancement to buy the software because it was too expensive. So we did the right thing, and we sold the software and let them build their own. So Rapid Insight has been in business. Anybody familiar with Rapid Insight? Ringing any bells? Great. One of the reasons we come to the conference is to let people know who we are. For over 10 years, our CEO and founder, Michael Laracy, um, he's a recovering SaaS programmer. Um, he worked in the telecom industry, he worked for the Federal Reserve, and he was an excellent consultant building models, make a lot of money, and he thought there's gotta be an easier way and so that's why he developed Rapid Insight. Today's presentation is not about Rapid Insight, so if you're here just to learn about how it works, hopefully that's not what you hear about. This is more about communication and about predictive modeling within a real higher ed institution and how it worked. So hopefully that's what you came for. Um, and in my bio, you'll see something about how I'm a father of a daughter um, who was just accepted to college. So during that process, I saw we work with enrollment and institutional research as well. So I saw some of the programs that worked really well with predictive modeling and some of the ones that didn't with data integration because once she was accepted, I got to see all the emails and the, the postcards coming still asking her to apply. So that was always interesting that she sent out emails to everybody, told them she was accepted and she was going to X university and still people were sending out information saying, can't wait to have you on campus. So um, with that said, um, I'll leave the rest up to Mike and I'll be, be doing questions and answers afterwards. So if you could just say those, that'd be great. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay. So the uh, sub topic of our conversation today is going to be about how building a fundraising model is actually the easy part. Uh, putting it into practice is actually something that takes a little bit more work. And uh, as John just uh, went through and introduced us, um, <clears throat> Rapid Insight is a company that's been around since 2002. Uh, it does a number of things. In addition to predictive modeling, it has tools that actually help you prepare the data for the modeling. And we'll be touching a little bit on uh, both of those aspects of what the company provides. First, I'll give you a little bit more background about Mills College. Uh, we're in Oakland, California, liberal arts, founded in the mid-1800s. Um, we've got a population of uh, undergraduate women, totaling about uh, 1,000, and a graduate population, which is co-ed, of about 611. Actually, the graduate school is growing faster than the undergraduate school. And uh, if I drill down a little bit into this number of 16,000 solicitable alums, 
Um, I can tell you that about 5,000 of them are actually from the graduate school, uh, which for those of you who are in fundraising in higher ed, you probably recognize as a challenge all in itself, since there's a different kind of relationship that graduate students have with their institution versus undergraduate students. So we'll be giving most of our examples today, or actually all of our examples, uh, in dealing with the uh, solicitable undergraduate alums. First, let's talk about the various, um, just to kind of set the stage for where the Rapid Insight product suite comes into our process by looking at some of the phases of a modeling project. And obviously, the beginning point is having a question that you're trying to answer. And for a fundraiser, that usually um, breaks into two major categories, who's going to give and how much. And there are variations of those that you can come up with as you get deeper into it. But those are the two of the more fundamental questions that you have. A large part, in fact, probably the largest part of the time you'll spend on a modeling project is preparing the data to go into the model. And there's some good reasons for that. Uh, first of all, you're probably going to be drawing data from your institutional database that you use to track information about your constituents, but it's not going to be in the right format. So for instance, there's probably a field in your database that tracks the date of birth of everybody. For the modeling program, you're probably going to be more interested in how old are people today, or how old were they when they graduated. So you have to convert that date of birth into an age. Another interesting thing is uh, zip code. There's probably a field in your database that tracks what zip code uh, people live in. But in our case, we were interested in seeing how distance from the college to where the person lives might have impacted both their propensity to give and the size of their gift. So we needed to convert that zip code into a distance number. The other thing that's going to cause you to spend a lot of time in a, um, preparing data for the models is experimentation. Uh, you're always going to be asking questions or having ideas about what might actually be another variable that you could test to see whether or not it actually improves the performance of the model. Uh, I know of one person that was at a presentation and talked about how just as an experiment, he looked at the number of characters in the person's name as a potential indicator of whether or not they would be likely to give a major gift. Uh, not quite sure where he uh, ended up going with that, but again, it's a question you can ask. You can come up with the data and then you can at least test to see whether or not it uh, correlates to giving. So uh, in addition to experimentation, uh, what you also need to be thinking about when you prepare data for the model is preparing it in a way that's going to be robust and reusable. You're going to be able to, uh, you have to be able to prepare this data for modeling time and time again, year after year. You're not going to do it once and then forget it. So you need to have the tools available to be able to take a snapshot of data and use that as the basis for your model. And then actually we'll see maybe roll forward a year and say, well, let's pretend it's now next year. What will all these people look like then? And use that as the basis for scoring the model. And lastly, and probably the area that uh, you'll spend the second most time in is in implementation. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, not all fundraisers will see the immediate value of the uh, predictive modeling. They'll have their ways that they've been doing it forever, and they would like to continue doing it forever. But as data analysts, uh, one of our job is to help present to those um, fundraisers ways of seeing how the results of the model could, in fact, impact their program. And so that's where we'll actually begin with some stories of how you can, as fundraisers, put, or rather as analytics professional, put together a really simple tool that will help the fundraisers see the value of the predictive model and then also have some ideas for how they can implement the results of that model in their daily work. So let's start with this data, which is real data from Mills College. As I said, we have about 10 to 11,000 undergraduate alumni. I've broken them up um, into 10 equal size populations. A uh, fancy word for that is called a decile. And they're arranged in each of these deciles um, in a very random way. So there's no particular order to how they've been arranged in these 10 deciles. So it wouldn't be a surprise when we overlay the number of donors in each of those deciles that we come up with kind of a flat distribution. There's about the same number of donors in each decile. 
And this is the fundamental problem that the fundraiser has who's not using predictive modeling. If, in fact, becoming a donor is a completely random event, the fundraiser has no choice but to put the same amount of energy into every potential donor to make sure they capture all the donors by the end of the campaign. So as analytics professionals, our role is to help them show, uh, help show the fundraisers that in fact it is possible to sort the data a different way. And that is sort the data by the propensity or the probability that any individual will make a gift in the coming year. And once you do that, you now start to, in fact, reinforce what the fundraisers themselves intuitively know, that really it isn't a random act to become a donor. They just don't have the data to move from that one set of beliefs to the other. But now, when the, you show them this curve and say, oh, I can sort the data this way, you start to get some raised eyebrows and say, hmm, well, that might be helpful. Uh, we're going to go through a transition and really get to the most helpful way to show it, I think, which is to next show that you could go and produce a cumulative bar graph showing the total number of donors overall. And then in the last phase, produce what is referred to as a lift diagram that essentially is going to show you the percentage of cumulative donors across your 10 deciles. And what this graph is showing is that by the time you get to about the fourth decile, you've identified 95% of the people who have made a gift. So that says in, instead of the entire 10,000, you've now got it down to the 4,000 most likely people who will make a gift. So now, let's put ourselves into the shoes of a fundraiser a little bit deeper and think of how we might put this information to use. And oftentimes, the first place you go to is in looking at your solicitation cost. Uh, alums get solicited in a variety of ways across the fundraising year. Uh, we send out emails, we have a web page, we have a magazine uh, where there's a little reply device. We have a telephone calling program. We have students call you during supper time, of course, to uh, stop what you're doing and, and make a gift. And we also do direct mail pieces. Direct mail is kind of interesting because you can actually put a price tag on that and you can add up the dollars and cents for postage, handling, envelopes, paper, et cetera. And in our case, that comes to about $1.60 per piece, okay? Last year, in one of the segments that we mailed to, there were about 3,000 undergraduate alums who were either lapsed, meaning they hadn't made a gift in six years, or non-donors, meaning they had never made a gift to the college. We mailed to 3,000 of those in one mailing for a total cost of, uh, and, and well, the results of that you can see here, we got 10 gifts, total of $245 in revenue. Uh, the net income from that segment of the mailing was minus $4,500. So go back to our lift curve. And when we look at that lift curve, we can also, if we swing the pendulum in the other direction now, identify that in fact in the four most likely deciles of people who might make a gift, there's actually only 65 of those people who are either lapsed or non-donors. So this year, we, as an experiment, swung the pendulum in the other direction and said, well, let's just mail to those 65 people instead of all 3,000. And not surprisingly, actually, we got no gifts and no revenue, but it only cost us $141 to find that out. <laughs> Obviously, that's a bit of an extreme, what we learned. So in our spring mailing, we're going to go a little bit deeper into that pool of uh, non or lapsed donors, again, based on probability score. And, per, you know, we'll probably solicit a percentage of them rather than just 0.01%. Maybe we'll solicit the top 20% and see what that yields for us. Looking for that sweet spot. Now, people in fundraising, you'll probably recognize this example right away because uh, it happens all the time. Somebody comes forward and said, I need some money for something. And in this case, real example, middle of the campaign season, the athletics department comes to us and says, you know, we need a new boat for the crew team. Um, we'd like to get one every five years. Unfortunately, it's not in the budget. So why can't we just go and ask all the alums to make a gift? That would really help. You know, actually, all we need is $40,000 for a new boat. There's got to be at least four or 500 living alums who were on the crew team. I'll do the math. It's just 100 bucks a piece. Let's go. And right now, in 2014, we have a great message, a great story. This is the 100-year anniversary of rowing at Mills College. Fundraisers look at this kind of request, which comes all the time, and they literally roll their eyes back into their heads. 
uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's not fair to think of your alums as your checkbook, right? Second of all, the president of the college has identified her own shopping list of things totaling about seven or eight million dollars. Someone has to break the news to the coach that, sorry, the boat wasn't in there. So how do you do that in a way that doesn't sound like you're not being sensitive to their desire to increase the speed of the rowing team, um, but give them some data that maybe helps them see through the possibilities of what might be a better way? So we can go back to our deciles. And here I've just plotted where the living crew members are in the various probable donor groupings as I'm referring to them now. And really in that most probable range, there's only about 160 of those 400 donors that are situated there. So you really are probably gonna give about 160 donors. Now since you're coming to us also, coach, halfway through the fundraising year, uh, we've actually solicited uh, a lot of those folks and 108 of them have already made a gift. The chances of you getting a second gift from them right now, kind of slim. So maybe we could do this. I mean, if you, if you really think through the numbers here, um, let's say that we were wildly successful and got all those remaining uh, high probable donors to make their average size gift. And we, we could go back and get those who have already made a gift to give another 25% that's still only going to get you about fifteen to $25,000. And if you've asked for money specifically to buy a boat, when that money comes in, you can't do anything with it except buy a boat. So if you come up short, you're stuck. So um, one other thing to consider, uh, as I prepare this data, somebody remembered that about five years ago, 95th anniversary of rowing, we did a similar kind of appeal. And it wasn't explicitly for a boat, but it did actually result in about 160 gifts, totaling about $15,000. So with this, we were able to go back to the coach and say, well, you know, look, maybe a more reasonable approach might be to uh, include uh, a little special sentence in one of our upcoming mailings that we're already scheduling to do rather than making a special mailing. And those folks who are on the crew team will be reminded that this is the anniversary and please make a gift in honor of the crew team. And that way it doesn't kind of tie up your funds in something that um, won't be useful to you in the uh, short term. And the last example we'll look at is in how much to ask for. And folks in the annual fund uh, go through this exercise every year. We won't go into the details of this diagram, but this is a flow chart that lists the logic decisions or the logic tree that our annual fund director used to arrive at what to ask each undergraduate alum for in their annual fund gift. And there's about 19 end points you could arrive at here. And these are all aspirational numbers. In other words, it's what the annual fund director would like to have seen each alum give as a gift. We decided this might be a little bit complicated. And so uh, we tried an experiment. We took a couple of the larger segments here, broke them into two groups, two equal size random groups, and uh, we asked one half to give that aspirational amount that's described by this flow diagram. And we asked the other half to give what they gave last year. What we learned from that was that people generally chose to give what they gave last year. And we did this experiment last springtime, so we were able to, for this fall and this year, change the model, uh, change the algorithm to a much simpler uh, algorithm so that it's from a programmer's perspective, a lot cleaner and a lot more realistic. But a second thing that we did learn going through that exercise that there were in fact some people who chose to give more. And so the question that the fundraiser always has is how not to leave money on the table as it were. And wouldn't it be nice if we could identify those people who were really ready to give more by some other means than that complicated flowchart suggested and invite them to give more. So a strategy that we're now working on is based on another model that we built that predicts which of the undergraduate alums will make a gift of $1,500 or more. The significance of $1,500 is, well, that's where our gift clubs begin. So if those of you who are in higher ed or other locations where you have gift club levels, the $1,500 mark is the lowest rung on the ladder. And when your name gets published, you get a little symbol beside it and your classmates get to see that you're giving at least at that level. 
So this model has shown some pretty good lift, but even in that, we're able to look at those people in the most probable range and see that there are you know, at least 100 or so people that have given close to $1,500, but not yet given $1,500 in any single year. So the strategy that we're putting together is how to put them in their own segment for the next mailing and invite them to join us at that higher level of philanthropy. So these are kind of starting at the end of the process and looking at some ways you can use basically that one simple lift curve and the, the data that lives, lives underneath it to help fundraisers develop strategies for how to use the predictive model. So let's talk about the actual modeling process itself. And it begins, as I said, with having data that's probably going to be in multiple tables and not in exactly the right format that you're going to want to see it for the model. So the first thing you need to do is put it through some process that will prepare the data for the model. It's going to merge all the data from those various tables where it's living in your relational database, provide a uh, snapshot in time. You want to give some sort of a date range to this probably because you want to look at what people did, let's say, last year in the giving cycle. And it's going to um, prepare the data or convert the data into the format that you need. It's going to convert date of birth into an age, etc. So now you have a source file for the model that's going to have a whole set of attributes for people, their age, their distance, the number of children, what they studied. And it's going to um, be a snapshot of a particular point in time that you want to evaluate for your model. Now you build the model. The model is basically just going to be an equation that relates all those attribute variables to the behavior that you're trying to model. So at this stage, you've got that built using a reference data set. You have to now get ready to project forward into the next giving cycle. And you do that by going back to your data preparation program asking it to pretend that it's now next year and therefore update all of its variables. So it'll now identify who are the people that are in reunion this year, who are the people who have one more child this year than they did when we last made this model, and apply your formula to that new data set to arrive at a scored output file. So the scored output file is going to essentially have a number between 0 and 1, the higher the number the more likely the person is to exhibit the behavior that you're modeling for. So let's take a look at how uh, the Rapid Insight product suite helps, uh, helps to get you to that point. First of all, in preparing the data, we'll look at a product called Vera, which is a way of combining uh, data from various sources. And if you look at the diagram, the, this is the Vera work surface. The upper left-hand corner is showing you the various data sources, and it's just about anything you can imagine, Excel, Access, uh, ODBC, et cetera. You can have all those files there. Below that are the various kinds of manipulations that the program can perform, the various kinds of conversions that they can uh, perform on the data. And below that are the different ways of getting output from um, the program. This maybe looks a little bit busy, but actually it's um, processing four different files concurrently. And um, that's what each major path is across. It's starting with a different input file. It's transforming a couple of pieces of data. And it's actually merging data with some external data that we purchased. So the source files on the extreme left are the data from our internal database. And at the center there, it's taking some data that we purchased, and it's going to merge it together. So let's look at how it does that. Take a look at this first operation, which is called a transform. And this is a transform. As I said, we're interested to see how did distance from the campus affect uh, giving. So this is a transform uh, and the window that is used to set the transform up. In the extreme left-hand side, it's showing me all the variables that are in my data file. I've selected one called tzip, which is a zip code variable. Uh, the program has assigned an alias to it, A. And from the right-hand side of all the various kinds of functions and operations, I've pulled in a built-in function that the program has called distance from. And if you look at what the formula is doing, basically, it's going to compare the zip code 94613, which is the zip code of Mills College, with each individual zip code. And it's going to produce a variable shown down in the lower third called distance, which is the number of miles between that zip code and the zip code of the individual. So it's that easy. 
wasn't quite sure that the exact number of miles were the things that were going to drive being a donor or not, whether you were at 24.5 miles or 25.5 miles. So I took another transform and said, let me try to just group together people who live in different ranges of distance from the college. And so this is a binning function that the program also uh, provides. And it's creating a variable called dbin. It's shown down in the bottom. And what it essentially gives me is the ability to create a series of formula that uh, looks at that distance variable that I just created and says if the value is less than 25 miles, assign the string L25. If it's between 25 and 50, assign some other variable and so forth. So now I've essentially created what's called a categorical var variable where uh, I've got nine different values representing different ranges of distance and I'll be able to test that in my model to see how that um, variable might affect um, the outcome. And lastly, let's merge that external data, which is pretty straightforward if you've done any kind of work with access or things like that that join tables. Um, the merge function essentially takes the left-hand table, all the records, um, all the fields in that, and joins it uh, based on the ID uh, value to the source or to that purchase data that we uh, obtained, and it produces a new file that has the merged results of those two files. So now let's actually build the model, and to do that we use another one of the Rapid Insight tools. This one's called Rapid Insight Analytics. This is the primary um, screen that you'll see. There's a number of tabs down the left side that uh, allow you to look at the data in your data set with various uh, tools. We will not go into all of them. There's far too many. Uh, but this screen basically uh, shows you how the program has initially categorized all the variables. Uh, it breaks it into three categories, categorical like A, B, C, D, E, uh, binary, zero, one, uh, continuous, which would be a number from one to infinity or minus infinity, et cetera. And it has other functions there, all of which you have control over. Good example of that is the variable called class which is the year of graduation for each of the alums, happens to be a number. Uh, I choose to treat it in the model as a categorical value, variable because I think it's not so much that you graduated in 1971 versus 1970 that makes you one more than that person. It's just a way of showing that you're part of a different cohort. So categorical is a more appropriate way for doing that. And of course, down at the bottom, you choose which of the variables in your data set is your Y variable or the behavior that you're trying to model. And in this case, the field called donor, which is a binary variable that says either zero or one. Next thing that the program will do for you and really is required as part of the modeling process is it does something called automated mining. So when you go to that screen, it basically is going to show you which of the variables that you have created actually do have some relationship to the Y variable, a statistically significant relationship to the Y variable. And it's gonna break your data set into two columns, those that are related and those that aren't. Those that are related will get promoted and be able to go through the rest of the modeling process. Those that are not will be left behind. So now you actually get to build the model. And we're gonna be talking about a logistic regression model that also has the capability to do uh, OLS, ordinary least squares model. Uh, you get to do some setup here as to what proportion of the database you're going to sample, so forth. But basically, you go into the modeling tab, and the thing that people will most likely begin with is this function called build the model automatically. Uh, and basically, with one press of the button, the program will go through, evaluate all the variables for various um, scale factors or weighting factors. It'll also introduce some uh, built-in transformations of all of the variables, like a binary conversion of a variable or a, a square conversion of a variable to see if some calculation on those variables will actually affect the model. And um, the results of the model, you can, you can do this iteratively. You can then add or subtract variables at your leisure. Um, and what's shown down at the bottom is actually the model. So that first column called coefficient is showing you the weight factor that each of those variables on the left has in this particular model. 
And uh, those first few variables happen to be variables from the data that we purchased. There's a block of variables in the middle that are variables from our own data set. And down at the bottom, there are some of those trial variables that the program itself created. For example, I don't have a binary variable in my data set that said class of 2006. But the program invented that variable and said, hey, when I invent this, it actually improves the results of the model. So that, that's quite helpful. Now, actually, just a little bit of experiential uh, uh, input here. Uh, I didn't want to model the entire span of alums in one fell swoop. And that's because, as people, we go through phases in life. Uh, the things that drive our behavior as someone who is fresh out of school versus someone who is in the midst of raising a family versus someone who is now an empty nester um, are different. And so I modeled each of those populations separately using this tool. And you'll see at the end of the process, I need to pull that back together into a single um, data set. So we're now at this point where we have a scored uh, output file. And we go to the third part of the Rapid Insight product suite, which is called Rapid Insight Scoring Module. Again, it operates pretty simply. You select the data file that you want to uh, score. And this would now be the file of what people will look like next year. You apply or you select which of the model formulas, and that's what's shown in the box in the center right. That's actually the equation that will relate all of your attributes to your behavior. Then you press a button that says produce the model. And since I had to do that three times, I got three files. And uh, the first column in each of these is showing you the record identifier for each person in our system. And the next column is showing you the probability score that each person has uh, computed, or at least a sample of it. So the last thing, as I said, I needed to combine those three files into one, because that's the way I wanted to work with it for my various solicitations and reports, et cetera. And went back into the Vera product and uh, appended the three, uh, three separate files into a single file. And in addition to that, I used another one of the built-in functions called the quantile operation. And what that allows you to do is essentially to um, set up that decile calculation. So it'll sort all the data based on one of the fields in your file and you tell it how big a, a bucket essentially you want to create. In this case, I'm trying to create deciles. And it will then create an output file that uh, does a couple things. First of all, it'll sort it overall by probability. There'll be a column, the far right-hand column, that shows what's the actual uh, predicted donor decile that that person is in. And then it adds a column that says, well, which of those three source files did that data actually come from? So you get some sense here that, in fact, uh, by separating the population into those three separate files, uh, that gave a chance for some people with very little giving history to be right up there with those people who have been giving for 20 years in terms of their uh, scale factor and their weight factor in our modeling process. So at that point in the game, you've pretty much got all the information you need. And what is left really is just to go out and broadcast that to the world. Let them know what you have. And with any kind of luck, you'll attract the attention of a fundraiser. And then together, you can go out and do wonderful things uh, in your solicitations. So uh, at this point, I think we'll open it up for questions. Here's our contact information, certainly, uh, if you want to follow up with any other questions after the program. But um, we'll open it up now for questions. Yes? I had a question about scaling in the product. So in this example, you had 60,000 alumni. But at the University of Iowa, we went to like a million alumni with like 200 variables we want to look at. Uh, is Rapid Insight capable of producing processing that much data? So the question, I've been told to repeat this when people talk. So uh, 60,000 versus 2 million? And would Rapid Insight be able to? I can answer that. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I think it can. <laughs> and we start out with um, 250 variables. And it, through that uh, automated mining step, it eliminated uh, about uh, half of those anyway. So. And just to give you an idea, we're used by not just higher ed, but by uh, large pharmaceutical companies, hotel chains, um, cybersecurity firms. So there's no choking on the amount of data. Other questions? Wow, that's not good. Come on, one other one. Go yes. ahead.
Mm -hmm. so, so the question is, uh, over the years, do we essentially stick with the same set of variables year after year? Do we uh, take some out because we've found they don't contribute? Do we add some in, I guess, because we're kind of doing experiments? And the answer is yes to all those. Um, we build the tool to essentially build a common file year after year. Uh, we will put it through the modeling process at the end of the year to see, well, did 2014 behavior look any different than 2013 behavior? That's the time when we'll probably do some experimentation and introduce some brand new variables that people may have the I idea might be a contributor or not. And um, yeah, so the, the program basically that we've set up will start with the same core set and we haven't actually dropped anything out yet because there's really once the program is there to um, create it, there's not really a reason to. And who knows, over time, behaviors may change. As our programs change, uh, behaviors may change. So leaving the variables in there is uh, a good thing. And just on that same note, we, the general rule of thumb is throw the kitchen sink at it. So if you have variables that you've built over the years, then throw them at it. Um, we encourage it. Go ahead. Excellent. The fact that you're here proves that. So. Okay. Well, um, at let's see, this is the second college where I've used. Mills. Uh, at Mills, this is only our first year of implementation. Uh, at prior schools where I used it, uh, we've, we were able to reduce solicitation costs. We were able to um, maintain and increase participation. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a long-term process, but so far the results we've seen are positive, and it's been looking at participation rate, dollars raised, and um, like I say, we don't have that much of a track record at Mills, but I'm Pretty confident we're going to see kind of the same things. And if I can just apologize a little bit on the v VP, um, but the fact that you're here, how many other VPs of advancement do we have here? So that kind of gives you, and <coughs> congratulations. Where are you from, just out of curiosity? Okay. Well, congratulations to you, because that's an important part of this whole conversation is getting, does anybody here have problems talking to their VP of advancement when it talks about predictive modeling? Anybody? Well, congratulations to all of you, I guess. Yeah. The, um, one of the things we find is that sometimes there's a disconnect, because sometimes the VP of advancement does come from the part of the side that doesn't deal with the data and the research and that kind of thing. So it's great that you're here. Other questions? Yes. OK, so the question is, let's take a look at the previous Graph, this one? To 10. Right, so it, it takes everybody and puts them into one of 10 deciles. This is just showing the, a portion of the topmost deciles. So the question was, you know, what, what is this showing in terms of the overall database? And it's showing just the top. 30 or 40 records, and in this case, these are all uh, in the top, well, by definition, there's about 10,000 records in our database, so there'll be about uh, 1,000 records that are in this first decile, 1,000 records in the second decile, and it'll all be based on the predicted donor value that each one um, calculated out from the model. Yes, another question. Okay, so the question is, uh, clear connection here with uh, annual giving, but now what happens when you try to move into the space of major giving and what to ask there? And that is definitely a more complicated problem uh, as uh, uh, folks who were here in uh, a session yesterday afternoon that uh, Target Analytics, I think, participated in. Um, one of the challenges that any single institution will have is that if you don't have really a few hundred samples of a major donor, it will be difficult to build a predictive model based solely on your data 
of what a major donor will look like. So one of the options is to go with a product like the Target Analytics product where they're amassing data from larger populations and coming up with their own score, uh, and that will be helpful. I have seen another technique used, which is to calculate an annual giving score for each consistent, and then either multiply that by or group by a capacity rating for the individual. So you come up with kind of a cross product of capacity and probability, and that gives you a number that says, hmm, this is a bigger number than somebody else, so maybe they're worth spending more time on from the perspective. The probability score at least tells you they're a potential donor. The capacity score gives you the implication that they might have a lot to give. And so that's another approach that I have seen uh, organizations use to get at that major gift program. But it is difficult for a single organization to um, have enough samples uh, of major giving behavior. Yes. So the question is, have we built any models for parents and how is it different from alumni? And yes, and it's quite a bit different because you don't have the same number of data points about the parents as you do for the alumni. Uh, you don't know what major they took. You don't know uh, what activities they were in. You basically know what is on the student application. And so uh, there again is another potential use for outside data and um, <clears throat> being able to draw from a wider uh, range of variables of um, public domain information about the individuals because it's, you're not gonna have a lot about them uh, in your database. Now, that's for the incoming freshman parent. By the time they become a sophomore or a junior, you at least have a couple of years of giving history that those people have displayed or not displayed, which again starts to help you in the modeling process, but it is challenging. Another question? Okay, you want to? No, oh, you keep that going. One? I'm, I'm just okay. standing here for the ride there. I <laughs> okay, have to so edit the out is... the target analytics comment. But <laughs> so, okay. so the, uh, all right, you'll beat me afterwards. But uh, um, the um, question is at the stage just before modeling, what kind of impact, if any, do you have on those variables that get uh, selected for the next stage? And um, there is one little field on that screen which I didn't unfortunately copy in, and it's called P. So you get to set the p-value um, that you will use to evaluate the strength of correlation that those variables must show in order to move to the next phase. So you don't have it on an individual variable by variable basis, but you do get to set the overall uh, a p-value, which I'll certainly let John explain how p works. Um, but uh, that, that's the control that you have at that stage. And where, if I can just throw in, where that comes in play is you'll have somebody who says, I don't <clears> care <throat> what the model says, I want to know how that affects their giving. And so you can just go, okay, fine, whatever. I'm telling you it doesn't play an effect, but we'll lower the p-value and there you go, have a nice day. Um, so it makes everybody happy and that again goes to the communication. Because if they want to know what the engineering degree has an effect on the model, then you have to show that to them. You can't tell the person who's in charge that no, that doesn't play into the model, so you can't do that. So there's definitely a way to do that. Um, and just real quick before we uh, go on, we do a lot of things online and via the web. So the email and also if you go to rapidinsightinc.com, I gotta throw the plug out there. Um, there's also free trials available of the software. Um, I will tell you that at the beginning we started, we've been doing this for 10 years, that we love what we do and what um, the gentleman from Starbucks talked about yesterday as far as two of his P's, passion and people, that the analyst on the other side, we all know what you're doing. What you're doing results in students being able to go to school with better financial aid. It ends up with better facilities for the students. So it's not just about the data, just like it's not just about the coffee. Um, and so we take it pretty passionately at work. So when you call us with a question or you email us with a question, well, you don't just get a, you know, some rote answer. Or, I mean, we take it pretty seriously. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that in there with some of the questions I might have after you leave here that we usually have. 
um, please feel free, because we learn from that as well. So somebody else had, yes, sir. He's, uh, so the question was, have we applied it to survey data, or if Mike has? Um, it's funny, because I had somebody ask that earlier today. Oh, that's right, it was you. Um, <laughs> so um, the question is absolutely positively yes. Um, I know we have customers doing that. Um, I don't know if Mike has particular. We haven't used it in particular for survey data, but what we did do with it was use it to analyze our alumni connection score. We have an alumni connection score where we've kind of giving you weighted points for different behaviors. And so we did kind of just as an experiment use that to say, well, you know, who's not scoring at a high level that ought to be scoring at a high level? So we've done a little bit of playing around there, but haven't figured out, again, that challenge of how do you implement, what do you do once you have that answer? You know, how do you convert that into a program that drives behavior is the oftentimes the next stumbling block. But that's another application we had for it. Yes. So you're categorizing people into deciles. Um, have you looked at the deciles, like the range within a decile? Is that like, is that the sweet number that you found that where it's useful to categorize people into, like, you know, the, the predicted donor range makes sense within the first decile, the second decile? And if not, would you go to eight groupings or would you go to, you know, even percentile? Okay, so the question is, uh, this analysis we all looked at was based on a decile distribution, and have we looked at whether or not decile is the, is the right mix to do that with, uh, and what, what other ways of parsing the data within there might be options? And I don't know, has, has, have you guys looked at that at all? Or? Um, I don't know if I'm answering this question correctly, but the fact is, <clears throat> is that each school or each institution is gonna be a little bit different, and each model is gonna be different. And so, as far as when it makes sense, it depends on what question you're asking and what action you want to do afterwards. So each decile or each section is going to, each score is going to make sense depending on what your action is that you're doing. So if you want to make a decision based on some level, then you make that decision and then you put the next one. And then you can test it. You can retest those decisions. So the goal is not to build the model. We have people saying, well, we built the model and it didn't, you know, it showed that we were going to, you know, not hit our number. Well, then do something about it. You know, use, there's a what if section in there. So you can do the what if scenario. Um, and if that doesn't work out to what you want it, then change the what if scenario. If I do this, then that, then what? So I don't know if that answers what you're trying to do, but. Another thing that um, the fundraisers are interested in is when you show them this set of slides that show what are the variables and what weight are those variables having on the donor behavior, they then get a better sense of what they might think about in their programs. So for example, we have one, uh, and, and also what things they might not be able to change about their program. We have one variable in the uh, under 35 and uh, 35 to <clears throat> 59 range called TRG, which is a traditional grad, is what that variable stands for. We have a lot of non-traditional graduates. They come back after leaving college, after maybe five or 10 years, and then complete their education. So those are some of the, an example of non-traditional grads. And so it's interesting to see that in the younger models, that's starting to impact us more because that's a more recent phenomenon. Something we don't control, but something we need to be aware of. And just so you know, we got the rabbit ears, which means I'm guessing two minutes. Um, so um, let me just, if you got real quick, just before uh, we do the last question, there are some forms. If you want to fill them out, great. If not, I totally understand. Um, and I'll be outside if you have any questions, if you want to ask them. And I'm going to drag Mike with me, too, whether he wants to or not. <laughs> um, and thank you very much. We appreciate you guys coming in. And if you don't mind, sir, if we can just grab your question afterwards. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you.